All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Derek Dosenbrock. I'm an engineer uh, with the Federal Highways uh, Resource Center. Uh, I'm located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we're bringing to you today our winter webinar series. This is webinar six of a 10 webinar series. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. We're up to 185 participants. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us on this holiday week uh, for cone penetration testing, more better. And this is an adaptation of uh, uh, something which you may be hearing from one of our speakers, uh, Paul Main, who had been talking about uh, uh, more holes uh, and better holes. Uh, we're going to be presenting for you today an overview of cone penetration testing, history, background, and use. Uh, our first presenter, uh, Gerald, will be talking about uh, that. And then we're also going to run through the capabilities and some fundamental considerations, analytical practices and applications, uh, special topics such as piezometer installation, uh, ground truth for geophysics and seismic applications, as well as lessons learned and challenges with implementation. Uh, our uh, two presenters from state DOTs, um, Andrew and Ricardo, will be talking about uh, experiences uh, in the Ohio and Missouri Departments of Transportation. And then we'll have a Q&A panel with our presenters at the end of the session today. Uh, so I've introduced myself, and now it's an opportunity uh, to introduce our first presenter. Um, we're going to be uh, joined today by Gerald Verbeek, Paul Main, uh, Andrew uh, Jabsikowski, and Ricardo Todd. Uh, so as I change over here to let Gerald load up his presentation, I will uh, stop my share. And Gerald, you can start uh, your screen share. Uh, Gerald Verbeek is Dutch, uh, a cone head, and he's with Verbeek Management Systems and Allnamix Pile Testing Experts. Uh, he's actively involved uh, currently with DFI's Sustainability Committee and recently the chair of DFI's Testing and Evaluation Committee. Uh, he's been very active in promoting uh, soil and foundation testing philosophies and equipment uh, worldwide and has been involved with DFI's very successful It's Money, uh, Increased Testing Saves Money webinar series. And it's great to have him here today uh, to talk with us about cone penetration testing. Uh, Gerald. Thanks, Eric. Um, welcome, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, CPT uh, because as Derek was already saying, uh, I'm a Dutchman and probably because of that, I'm also a convinced conehead. Uh, CPT was developed, as we will see in a few minutes, uh, in the Netherlands. It's widely used in the Netherlands, and every opportunity I can get to talk about CPT is, is very welcome. Uh, but at the same time, I will try not to be biased and give you an objective uh, picture of what cone penetration testing is really all about. Let's start very simple. What is CPT? Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see a truck that is pushing a, a cone into the ground at a constant push rate of 20 millimeters per second or 0.8 inches per second. And that cone that is completely standardized uh, dimension-wise um, measures the cone resistance or the tip resistance, it measures the pore water pressure, and it measures the sleeve friction. And those measurements are taken every 0.4 of an inch, every 10 millimeters, until the cone reaches the target depth or when you hit refusal. That in a nutshell is what CPT is all about. Now, what is most important here is that it's standardized. It's standardized in the United States to, through ASTM D 5778. And because it's standardized, the results are repeatable. And what it, uh, in respect of what kind of equipment you're using, you get basically the same results. What are those results? Well, once again, a, uh, you get the tip resistance, which is the purple line. You get the, the sleeve friction, the orange line, and then you get the pore pressure that is being measured. Not really the true pore pressure because of the, the fact that the cone is moving through the ground. You have a dynamic effect there, so it's really the dynamic pore pressure, but you do get a pore pressure, and you can equate it then with the hydrostatic pressure that is indicated in the, uh, the light blue line on the, the, uh, the graph on, on the right. Those are basically the measurements that you're getting. But what is more important is what's happening when you come to the field. 
as this figure is scrolling down, that is really what's happening in the field when you do CPT. Let me do this again for you. You come to a site, you start pushing your cone down, and as you push your cone down, you get a continuous profile of the three measurements, but also what you see here on the right-hand side, an indication of what kind of soil behavior type you have, what kind of soil type you have, not necessarily the soil type per se, but what, how it behaves as is what type of soil. And those results appear on your screen as you push the cone. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, you get a continuous profile, not a reading every couple of feet, of three parameters, and not just one, as with, CPT, as with SPT. SPT, you get the N value. You may get a reading every five feet, every two and a half feet. But here you get a continuous profile measured every 0.4 of an inch, those three parameters tip, sleeve, and the, uh, the pool pressure. And those things are, the fact that it is continuous is very important because what you see here are the results of a study that was done uh, by uh, Purdue University. The same location, two SPTs were done and the results you see on the left-hand graph and two CPTs were done, both all at the same location and those results were then compared. The first one, you have a look at what's there between six and, and 10 meters or six and nine meters. The SPT values kind of indicate that uh, the, the N value continually goes down from about 40 to say about 15. When you look at the CPT results, you see that it was not a, a gradual reduction. There were all kinds of layers, all kinds of differences, all kinds of variation that was not caught by the, uh, the SPT, because SPT is basically just uh, connecting dots, whereas CPT is really me taking measurements continuously. The other thing, just kind of interesting to note, if you go look at in the blue oval, you see that there's a huge variance. Uh, you have a one measurement said that the SPT value, or the N value was about 60. The other one says about 30. Yeah, so you have a variation in your results, whereas what you can see on the cone resistance, it's much more consistent and there's much less variation there, but that's a separate point. The second thing that is important to, to notice, as I showed you that graph a few moments ago, is that the whole process is very simple and very quick. You get to the job site, you push the cone, and then you issue a report all in about 25 minutes. And when I say 25 minutes, it is for a hole, say 60 to 75 feet deep. That is how fast it goes. And if you have a wireless connection, you can send the report with the raw data back to the office and the engineer can start looking at it, can start making decisions on the basis of, of the results. You don't have to wait for days or weeks to get the, the results back from the lab uh, with your SPT data. That's what CPT really is in a nutshell. Where is it used? Well, as I told you, I'm a Dutchman. So let's start with a project that we were involved with earlier this year, just like all the other projects that I'm going to briefly talk about. Uh, but one project we were working on in, in the Netherlands was the foundation of uh, wind turbines, an offshore uh, wind farm. And CPT was performed at the exact location of every single wind turbine so that you had the exact soil parameters for that particular location. Not just something in the area, no, where that monopile went down, that is where we got the CPT and therefore the data. Second project was in South Africa, where we looked at the, uh, the storage area for tailings. And you see the picture here. Uh, this tailings area is used to, uh, to drop tailings from uh, several gold mines in, in that area. And CPT was done with a 20 ton pusher that was mounted on a little trailer. Uh, and you can see, oh, that went too fast. Uh, you can see there that there are two ground anchors that are uh, used on, on both sides uh, to uh, give sufficient uh, dead load, sufficient reaction force for the cone to, uh, to be pushed into to the ground. The next area was in Oman, where we performed CPT both before and after ground improvement was done, the, the site was uh, uh, divided into a grid. And at each location, CPT was done twice, once before and once after the ground improvement to make sure that the ground improvement was done properly. Bangladesh, 
Uh, there we use CPT to figure out the uh, liquefaction potential uh, of the, uh, the soil. Uh, and there you have a situation like this. The, the pusher uh, here in, in yellow uh, was mounted on a big skid. And on both sides of uh, the, the pusher, sandbags were replaced to make sure that you had sufficient reaction force. Not a very uh, easy way to do it. It took quite some time to put the pusher in, in place and get it, uh, get it loaded, but it can be done that way. In New Zealand, we use it as a site investigation method for an additional building in a paper mill. You see a, a top view here, the, uh, the area uh, with the gushed red line uh, was there to, um, and it's an area roughly 300 by 450 feet. And you see that we did eight CPTs there. Um, two of them were seismic CPTs, the blue triangles, uh, and six regular CPTs, the yellow triangles. And then for correlation purposes, we did two boreholes as well to make sure that the soil behavior classification that we got uh, was, was verified or correlated with the borehole results. In Canada, we did it for uh, the foundation of a new bridge. Here in the United States, we performed CPT as a preliminary site investigation for a port expansion project. And there we used a, a truck that you see here. Obviously, uh, we don't need any additional ground anchors anymore as we used in, in South Africa, because you can use the weight of the truck as the, uh, the ballast uh, to create the sufficient uh, reaction force. And then finally, uh, we were involved with a project in Brazil where we performed CPT to check the condition uh, of a tailings dam uh, after failure of such a dam at a different location. We were not involved in any project in, uh, in Antarctica this year uh, or ever, to, to be honest with you, uh, but I did pick up uh, one project that was done by a uh, acquaintance of mine in, uh, in Australia who did a research project there to investigate the impact of, of snow density, the penetration rate, and then the cone size on, on CPT results. The reason why I added that project is by showing you these examples, I can really say that CPT is being utilized all around the world. Everywhere where you go, you will find people that are cone heads or that apply CPT. And it would imply that everybody's enthusiastic, like you see this, this figure on the left, when asked, okay, are you happy about CPT and is CPT a useful method? The answer should be yes. Reality though is that and maybe some among you are feeling that way. Uh, well, maybe a better answer is, is maybe. And you may be thinking that, yeah, CPT is fine, but there are simply too many issues. So let's explore some of those issues to, to explore why you should not use CPT, or at least in the opinion of some, why you should not use CPT. The first argument that is often mentioned is that it's a new method. Really an argument that isn't valid because CPT was developed in the 1930s. Uh, back in the Netherlands, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a need for uh, some new soil testing methods for the Dutch railroads. And Peter Badensen developed the, the CPT method. Basically, here you see one of the first uh, CPT units on a little uh, cart behind a, a bicycle around 1940. It was all manual, as you can see here, uh, a five ton unit. Uh, the cone is driven manually into the ground. Uh, the readings are taken uh, and, and written down. Everything is completely manual. Um, and then after World War II, when there were plenty of uh, old army trucks uh, around uh, Europe, uh, you can see here that uh, still the same manual unit is now mounted on the, the back of a, of a truck. And you can see that you use a steel plate to provide uh, some additional uh, reaction force. And the next step would, of course, be that you now create a nice cabin where this uh, person is still manually pushing the, the cone into the ground and uh, to collect the data. So it has been around for a while. Initially, all manual, but then in the late 1950s, uh, we started getting hydraulic pushing rigs, uh, first for 10 ton, later for, for 20 ton, uh, which made CPT a lot easier to do, but not necessarily more detailed. That really changed in 1965 when the so-called Begemann cone was, was introduced. And that cone added a 
shaft, a sliding shaft, so that you could also measure now the sleeve friction. Until then, you only measured the, the tip resistance of the cone. It was a uh, simple piece of metal that only measured the tip resistance. But from starting in the mid 1960s, you started measuring the, fleece, the sleeve friction as well. And then really the big step forward was in the early 1970s when the electric cone came into uh, to use. And since then, we have been basically using the, the same design uh, ever since. Here you see the cones uh, to kind of show you uh, the, the progress. At the, the bottom, you see the simple mechanical cone. Right above that, uh, the, the Begemann cone with the, the, the sleeve. Uh, then in the top picture there, you see a, uh, an analog cone, an electric cone, but, but analog. And then on the, the right hand side of the screen, a digital version of that cone. And now with a video uh, unit behind it as well, so that you can actually see what's happening as you move the cone down into to the ground. Here you see the kind of the history on the interior of the, the truck. Uh, you've already seen the picture on the bottom left. Uh, the top center is kind of a, a dated interior of a CPT truck, dated because uh, the electronic panel that you see there is kind of uh, 1990s uh, type of technology. Um, quite often now, uh, trucks have uh, HMI screens, human machine interface screens, where you have a touch uh, screen uh, that can control the, uh, the whole CPT process, including the balancing of the truck. And that's the, the latest. But basically, what I try to convey to you that a CPT is not new. It has been around for a long time, for almost 50 years, and that means that it's almost as old as the old analog color TV. Uh, and uh, by or that means that basically this technology is proven and, and well uh, has well proven itself in, in history. The second argument that is often used is, well, I've never heard about it in school. Now, why did they tell me in, in college and at the university when I got my master's degree only about SPT and not about CPT? Well, maybe that has to do with the, the classes that, that you took, because here you see four individuals. You'll hear in a little bit from Paul Main at uh, Georgia Tech, but Jason Young at uh, University of California, Davis, uh, Rodrigo Salgado at uh, Purdue, uh, and, and Lemnitzer uh, at the University of California at Irvine are four individuals that definitely talk about CPT in their classes. So maybe it's just a function of what classes you, you took uh, while you got your, your degree. Another argument, well, it's not used in my organization. Well, then my invitation is to join the party. Uh, let's start using it. Uh, many others have uh, gone before you. So and you'll hear some of the DOTs, how they have implemented the, uh, the system as well. The fourth argument that is often mentioned is my client does not accept this method. Well, hopefully these presentations as part of the Everyday Counts uh, program um, will help you to, to see that this, uh, this soil investigation method is really an accepted method and uh, should, be, uh, should be utilized. And you see there, uh, it's, we talk about the A game, the advanced geotechnical methods in exploration, or well, probably a little bit better description, and it's also now used uh, quite a bit, is underutilized geotechnical methods, because CPT is definitely underutilized. The fifth argument, well, the soils are not suitable for CPT. Where I work, the soils are basically too hard, and there are too many boulders. Well, let's take the first one first. Uh, what you see here on the right-hand side is a little graph uh, on the horizontal axis, the SPT values, on the vertical axis, the, the push force. And what you see there is that if you have a, an SPT value, an N60 value of about 80, you need roughly, roughly 15 tons to push a cone into the ground. And 15 tons is well in the capability of, of most CPT trucks, which means that if you can push a split spoon in the ground, you can push a cone in the ground. And there's really no, no reason to say that in that case, your, your soil is too hard. Provided, of course, that you don't hit major boulders. Because I told you at the beginning, I would be uh, try to be objective, uh, and boulders are a problem. Large chunks of concrete in, in landfills or large pieces of steel uh, in, in the landfill are a problem too. Uh, there is no such thing as a, a perfect method, and that is one of the limitations that, that CPT has. 
The next item that I briefly want to mention is this, uh, the argument that you need samples to test in the lab. And my first thought always then is that well, apparently you have plenty of time to spare in your project execution because by the time you take a sample and you then get the results, and you talk about uh, roughly um, uh, something close to uh, three weeks uh, later. Uh, and uh, is it really necessary? But if you do need samples, CPT has a pot uh, possibility that you can utilize a uh, push the count again, but then when a dummy count, uh, you can retract it, uh, the tip as you see here and take the sample up to three feet in length and two and a half inches in diameter. The next item, our design methods are based on end values. So why would I do CPT? Because I need end values. Well, my response would be, well, let's just start talking about uh, a getting a utilized uh, a direct uh, method. Uh, and uh, what you see are worked examples from uh, the Jura code, but also uh, MinDoc has put a manual together where you can utilize the, the cone measurements directly from um, uh, to do your design. And then finally, the argument that there's no return on investment. And I basically briefly want to introduce or that, that thought based on site variability. And it is from, taken from a presentation that was uh, given a couple of months ago as part of the It's Money webinar series by, by Rob van Dorp, who talked about a, a project where you had two initial CPTs as part of the initial site investigation. You see them on the left and the right hand side. And the tip resistance obviously is, is a lot more uh, on the, the left hand side compared to the right hand side, but they're differently, definitely different. So it was decided to do 22 more CPTs in an area of roughly of about 300 feet uh, by about 150 feet. So a small area, lots of CPTs. And what you found there was that it was hard to figure out how the different layers correlate. But as these results were generated uh, and they were sent back to the office, uh, they were analyzed and it was decided right in there to do another 22 uh, CPTs to get them uh, out of there. Uh, and that gave you then after 46 CPTs, a, a very good understanding of what the soil was all about. With those 46 CPTs, you could talk about the um, layer A and, and C, where you both had a clear bearing stem, although at C it was uh, was deeper, and then B, uh, it was basically a friction situation, which meant that if you had done your initial site investigation based on location A, you'd have a lot of the piles have been too short, which left a failure foundation. If you base them on location C, the piles would have been too long, which would over-design foundation and possibly problems with pile installation. And in both cases, uh, you would have big problems with the piles in uh, profile B or in uh, location B, because there the, the foundation would again have failed. So with the enhanced soil investigation, you can optimize your design. You can prevent a lot of problems because site variability is real. And it, that, so an uh, advanced or enhanced soil investigation is easily done with, with CPT. And it brings me then to the conclusion that CPT is an efficient and exciting soil investigation method. It's widely used and accepted, and it generates data that can be used as direct input values in your design, and is a great tool to deal with site variability. And with that, thank you. And if there are time for questions or later on, I'm more than happy to, to answer your questions either now or later on, you can always contact me and more than happy to talk about CPT at any time. Derek, back to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Gerald. Uh, greatly appreciate that presentation. Um, let's see. Uh, one question uh, for you from the chat pod. Uh, what is the typical cost range of CPT in the offshore field? Uh, I guess there's some cost parameters such as water depth, uh, distance to port. Uh, considering these conditions, is uh, CPT cost effective and competitive? Um, it is definitely cost effective. It is competitive. We, we do quite a bit of offshore work. The, the big thing right now is, is really it's the cost of the vessel. It's not necessarily the, the, the CPT unit. Okay, a uh, CPT or no, a uh, full scale 20 ton CPT unit uh, might cost you something like uh, uh, half a million dollars or so, but that's not the issue. The issue is, is the vessel. Uh, it's the day rate of your vessel to, to get to, uh, to the CPT uh, location, uh, and it's uh, how you set up your, your contract, 
uh, but uh, right now, especially for, for wind farms, uh, we apply CPT uh, all the time and we, we do quite a bit of work offshore. As a matter of fact, we just finished a project offshore in Ireland uh, with, with CPT, so it's definitely cost effective and it's efficient and uh, something that's done on a regular basis. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, a comment from the chat pod noting that the the uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology will be starting an eight week summer course in 2021 on in situ measurement, uh, which will involve extensive coverage on the CPT. So that's uh, great news for a, another university. Uh, I understand they have a, a cone head now on their faculty. Uh, our next speaker uh, today is going to be Paul Main. Uh, Paul Main is uh, the second half of uh, a pair of uh, distinguished debaters uh, who earlier this year in September uh, were on the winning team of uh, ASCE's virtual technical conference for the geo debate SPT versus CPT. Uh, both Gerald and, and Paul uh, did their uh, debate team proud. Uh, Professor uh, Main is with the uh, School of Civil Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, also a conehead and an international expert on geotechnical site characterization, active in a number of professional organizations, ASCE, TRB, DFI, and, and several others. So uh, with that, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, Derek, thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing, ah, now I see it, okay. And. Looks good. Laser pointer, okay, I have that now. So, so let's talk a little bit about the cone penetration test, uh, specifically for geotechnical site exploration, but also some applications to foundations. And as Gerald pointed out, we have three continuous readings. We have QT, the cone resistance, U2, the pore water pressure, and it's a dynamic pressure, and FS is a sleeve friction. So uh, we collect these at 20 millimeters a second. Uh, the data go right into the computer. And so we're in a good position there to do the analysis uh, as soon as the results uh, become available. And um, not advancing like I wanted to. <laughs> ah, there we go. So here's a selection of the penetrometers we have in our arsenal at Georgia Tech. Uh, you can see that they all have a 60 degree apex. There is no boring, there's no sample, there's no cuttings and no spoil. That bothers some people. On the other hand, we do get continuous readings of stress, friction, and pressure. And we have immediate access to the data so we can do the analysis literally on the fly. So it's, it's fantastic. Here, here's an example of those three readings. We have red squiggly lines, that's the cone tip resistance. Green squiggly lines is the sleeve friction and blue for water, so uh, the water pressure. And this uh, shows you uh, we're going down fairly deep, uh, 53 meters. So that's uh, uh, pretty close to about 175 feet. That's quite nice. Happens fairly quickly, probably took about mm, two, two and a half hours to get this deep at the site. So it's much faster than soil borings. Uh, you can generally do about 400, 500, maybe even 600 feet a day with CPT compared to maybe something on the order of 100 foot a day of soil boring. So much more information quickly. Uh, we have special vehicles, a truck like this. What's great about this with the enclosed cabin on the back end is that we, um, we can work in any kind of weather. It could be snowing or raining, sleet. We're still gonna go forth with the sounding that we planned. Um, if uh, in Atlanta, one of our big issues in the summer is it's very hot and muggy and it's not safe to work with a 140 pound hammer and slippery rods and you're lifting big heavy augers, but uh, here we can just turn on the air conditioner. So, so we have uh, all the comforts 
of uh, the laboratory, just taken right out to the field. And these, uh, they're, the equipment, it doesn't have to be large trucks. Uh, we, we have uh, rubber tired vehicles there shown there, IGS in Brisbane, Australia. We have track mounted equipment. So if, the, if you need accessibility on uh, poor site conditions, you, you have that. Uh, this uh, orange rig here on the uh, middle right-hand side is a track truck. So it's got both. You could drive, you drive it down the highway as a truck. And then if you need the accessibility of uh, say a tractor, uh, you, you just uh, divert the hydraulics to lowering those tracks down. So, so that's quite nice. Um, here's what we use at Georgia Tech. We have a Ford F-350 flatbed truck. Uh, it's uh, got twin earth anchors at the back end. The whole truck only weighs six tons, but it has a 20 ton hydraulic cap capability because of the anchors. Uh, why six tons? Well, anything more than that, you need special license. And since my graduate students are running this truck, uh, then we, we don't really have the luxury of getting them involved in getting the special truck license so they don't have to stop at way stations and all that. So we, we've used that at a number of locations there shown on the slide. Uh, here's a sounding from uh, Blytheville, Missouri. This may actually be one of um, the, uh, yeah, the Mid-America Earthquake Center. Uh, and so uh, you can use all three readings to help you tell what kind of soil behavior type. Just, just let me show you a very quick method is to um, put a demarcation line, a vertical line at 50 tons per square foot. If the cone tip resistance is five megapascals, that's the boundary. And so when the red squiggly line exceeds that, you're in a sand. And when it's less than five megapascals, again, 50 tons per square foot, it's clay. So you see here we have about, oh, roughly 10, 11 meters of clay. And then uh, below 11 meters, it's, it's primarily sand. So it's pretty easy to read these signatures once you get a little uh, introduction to those. Again, you can also use FS and U2. Uh, repeatability. Uh, this is very interesting. This is the New Orleans area, and um, there were some uh, soundings done by Terracon. Those are the blue squiggly lines. Again, three separate readings, not just one reading, but three separate readings, continuous. And then some, some people had some questions, so they brought in a separate rig, SCAPS rig, which was actually out of Savannah, Georgia, and they set up three months later totally different equipment, totally different crew. These soundings are about one meter apart and you can see the repeatability is just awesome. Very, just, just right on top of, obviously once you test that one axis, that sounding location, you can never test that exact piece of ground again, but, but these are, uh, I think, quite comparable. Now, when we go to interpret, we have so many different possibilities in the, the interpretation of this method. With CPT, we can use, of course, empirical methods. That's the only methods we have available for SPT, totally 100% empirical. But we can do that, of course, with um, CPT. We have analytical methods. Those are the ones uh, developed that we'll talk about a, a little bit later. We have statistical methods where we have lots of dots. We have something called dislocation theory that comes out of Penn State. We have finite elements. Uh, University of Michigan's done some finite element methods. Strain path method comes out of MIT. Finite differences and discrete element methods. So we have many different uh, ways that we can approach the interpretation of CPT. We have, these, these are all available software packages to help you interpret the CPT results that you've collected. So you can see there's quite a large collection uh, and we could spend hours literally talking about these different uh, computer software programs available. Uh, lots of recent advances in the interpretation of so many different uh, parameters, uh, ranging from relative density, unit weight, 
uh, state parameter, liquefaction, and we don't have time to go through those today, but just to give you a flavor, we'll talk just quickly about friction angle, OCR, undrained shear strength, and direct CPT methods for foundations. Uh, with the soil behavior type, uh, we can use all three of the readings. Uh, some, some of the methods, there are different methods available, but uh, it's nice to use all three methods to help you discern the soil behavior type. And some of these are typically done in a normalized uh, piezo cone parameters. Uh, those are defined here. And uh, let's call the normalized cone tip resistance uppercase Q, the normalized sleeve uppercase F, and the, uh, one of the types of normalized pore water pressures called B sub Q. So the, these are the, these were developed so oh, geez four decades ago. They're not new. Uh, there has been some updating in how we do the normalization shown there in point four, uh, QTN, um, and th that's that's okay too. So um, with that, uh, let's here's one of the most common soil behavior type charts. This is the one that Peter Robertson developed in 1990. Uh, and you can see that we have in this soil system, we have nine different types of soil, soil classification. So um, zones two through seven can be de described literally by the arc of a circle where this parameter I sub C is called the CPT material index. And that depends on the normalized cone tip, that's uppercase Q and the normalized sleeve friction, that's uppercase F. And so that's a very quick, convenient way on a spreadsheet to determine what kind of soil you're in. We can take that QT and that uh, normalized value. Uh, if you're using units of say tons per square foot, it's actually atmospheres, but that's pretty close to tons per square foot. It's just the net cone resistance QT minus the overburden stress divided by the square root of the effective overburden stress. And you can see that we have uh, 24 sands. These are all undisturbed samples of sands. These are very expensive to obtain. Um, many of them were by freezing. Uh, these are on the order of about $30,000 per soil sample. So not everyone can afford to do th these, but you can get a, a very good reliable evaluation of the friction angle uh, from the cone penetrometer. Uh, undrained shear strength is something we more focus on in clays, and uh, you'll see people use an NKT factor. That's, you that's when you take the cone, net cone resistance divided by a factor NKT to get the undrained shear strength. Well, it depends on what kind of undrained shear strength you're looking for. If it's a soft clay, you'll, you might see people use a number of uh, 15. Uh, that's because they're looking for a simple shear mode, but for triaxial compression, it's probably a a value closer to 12, but it actually tracks with what kind of clay it is. Is it sensitive clay? Is it onshore clay, offshore clay? Is it fissured clay? So this helps us, uh, this helps us determine the NKT factor to use. Um, and uh, Gerald alluded to it earlier about, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between taking samples and testing them in the lab. Well, it's the, the cone penetrometer is very analogous to a triaxial test. In fact, it's the same equipment, load cell, poor pressure transducer, filter element, and something to measure displacement. It's just that you want to test one perfect cylinder sample in the, in the lab, or do you want to tell, bill, test billions and billions of soil particles? So in a way, it's kind of like a triaxial test on the fly. You're, you're, you're same, same equipment, same measurements. It's just you're testing them all very uh, uh, much continuously down to say 30 meters and you're getting much more information about your the ground that you're trying to work with. So you can actually get the friction angle of clays. We don't have time to go through the theory here, but we have papers if you're interested in that. The friction angle now requires not only uppercase Q, the normalized cone resistance, but also the pore pressure BQ. And so that theory is shown here. Uh, there's an approximation. Here's an example. This is a, a PhD 
Melissa, Mal Mal uh, Melissa Landon from uh, UMass Amherst. And this is a sounding that she did in Boston Blue Clay. And you can see the, the uh, green squiggly line matches nicely with the, with the four uh, series of uh, samples that she took at different depths and tested in triaxial compression, getting about the same friction angle, 35 degrees. Uh, we recently completed a study. Uh, this is part of the study, over 100 clays. We're actually up to 140 clays. Uh, and again, triaxial versus cone penetrometer. I think uh, statistically it shows a, a good way to go. Uh, another parameter we're very interested in is OCR. So we might run a, take samples and run a consolidation test. That's going to be the benchmark, of course, one-dimensional consolidation tests. Uh, we have an analytical model that takes you through that. Again, we don't have time to go through the details, but I'd be glad to come back sometime and explain this to you. Uh, but there's the analytical model. By the way, when we talk about U2, we're talking about this U2 over here on the piezocone, not the excellent music that you could, hey, it's a good idea to listen to music. So maybe you play some U2 in the black background while you're doing the analysis. Uh, anyhow, we could take that theory and simplify it. So we have three equations for uh, pre-consolidation stress here, if you will. Um, and so uh, we can apply those. Uh, they help you decide what kind of clay you're in, it turns out. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that here. Here's an example. I can take um, some data from um, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, they test the famous San Francisco Bay mud. There are the three readings, cone resistance, sleep friction, pore pressure. And you can see all three methods agree with each other. And, the reason, and the, for some reason, they never took samples at three depths but the, the, these are constant rate of strain consolidometers. And so you see it's a lightly over consolidated clay and everything agrees with each other. Uh, here's another example. This is a famous test site in the United Kingdom called Both Kenner. Uh, same idea, we're using three equations to estimate the pre-consolidation here. They all agree with each other and when they do, they also agree with uh, three types of consolidometers. So, so this is a good quick way to get the uh, yield stress in what we would call regular clays, normal clays. That method was extended so we could also determine uh, pre-consolidation in silts and sands as well. Uh, it's the same format. Pre-consolidation stress is 0.33 times Q net raised to some power M and M is one in clay and drops to about 0.75 in sand. So here's an example of that. This is a newer site. Uh, Blessington is a site in Ireland used for offshore pile testing. And this is their interpretation, uh, University of uh, College Dublin, not my interpretation. The, the, the squared yellow dots are uh, interpreted consolidation tests to give them the OCR. And then here's this method using four different CBTs. And I think you might agree that uh, we're getting similar answers uh, with those. So much quicker though, I mean, uh, than running lab, taking samples and then bringing them back to the lab and running lab tests. Okay, when we have a CBT, we can do, we can do what we've been doing is to take the, the three readings of the cone and interpret soil parameters and then go conventional limit plasticity uh, to do bearing capacity, elastic continuum theory to do settlement calculations, or we have another option, we can go to direct CPT approaches. And so those are kind of interesting. So let me just show you uh, this, this method. Uh, this is uh, just an example of uh, CPT method uh, for footings on sand. So. PF is the applied stress of the footing by the footing. Uh, this is a, a factor for sand, 0.58. Uh, QC is the cone resistance uh, times the square root of S over B. S is the settlement of the, of the footing and B is the, the side of a square. These are for square footings. Um, and so uh, that's very easy to use. That's very easy to use. In fact, it's the same method to get bearing capacity. In Europe, P max is defined, the bearing capacity is defined when S over B is 
So if I take the square root of 0.1, I end up with 0 0.316. 0 0.316 times 0.58 gives me 0.18. So the bearing capacity of the sand is just 18% of QC. Gee, how easy can it be? It's, it's a lot easier than, than doing this, the standard limit uh, plasticity solutions that we normally have. Uh, to show you this is actually, we've been working on this method for all, over 10 years now. Uh, here's a new case study that came up since we published it in the CPT proceedings. So here's that equation we talked about. We have three footings. Uh, the footings are 2.5 meters on a side, eight foot, that's pretty big. Uh, the average cone resistance we're interpreting here is 14 megapascals. Um, and you can see uh, the predicted line is the red, uh, sorry, the orange dash line. And then each of those um, three colored dots are the footings that were measured. So uh, I think that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, it's developed based on load tests. And we started out with 70, 70 footing load tests uh, that were done by research organizations. And then more recently, Derek and I put together uh, an additional uh, number of um, uh, another 60 footings that were uh, test, uh, actually full, full scale uh, footings, fairly large footings here. Look, the mean uh, side of the footing is 6.7 meters and the mean breadth of the footings is 10 meters. And, and some of these are much, much larger than that. But we, we put all those data together and uh, we, we now have a slight adjustment. It's the same equation I showed you earlier. It's just now we add in a term to account for rectangles and A is the length of the rectangle, B is the width. And so um, uh, more or less they all fit together and has a fairly nice coefficient of determination of uh, 0 0.912. Oh yeah, family circus. We're gonna plan it right here, daddy. Yeah, probably not a good idea to let your kids pick the uh, test location if you're gonna do CPT. Again, you don't wanna hit boulders if you don't have to. Um, another thing uh, Gerald mentioned was uh, seismic cone. So it, it's so easy to add a, a geophone or a, a biaxial geophone or a triaxial geophone or an array of geophones into the cone penetrometer. And uh, so for us, uh, this is the minimum test that Georgia Tech will do as a seismic cone, but you can get four, even five readings, depending on what kind of geology you're in. Uh, so it just optimizes the data collection. So uh, we can easily add in shear wave velocity. And so here's an example at Merrimack River in Missouri, not too far from St. Louis. And you can see the detail again. So now we have red squiggly lines, green squiggly lines, uh, blue squiggly lines and brown lines. So uh, with that, we can use elastic continuum to tell us about the displacement of the foundations. We can use the cone data to tell us the capacity. The shear wave velocity gives us a modulus. We can put that together. So here's a case study. We're on I-85, uh, about a half hour south of Atlanta. We have a drill shaft uh, load test. Those are the dimensions of the shaft. Here's, here's our uh, cone rig. And so we, um, here's the sounding. There's the seismic cone. Uh, we're gonna use the first three readings to determine the um, capacity of that foundation. And then the shear wave velocity gives us the modulus that we can use for displacements. And there you go. So we have, uh, the upper curve is the top down, the load at the top of the drill shaft, uh, the, and the purple dots is what's measured in the load test by G dot. And then the load that went into side friction is shown by red line and uh, by theory and red dots measured. And then the blue dots are how much load made it to the base, the bottom of the foundation, and the blue line represents the elastic continuum solution. So. So there you go, you, get, you can get the complete low displacement capacity of foundation, deep, deep foundations. Uh, you can also obtain the data you need to do finite element analysis if that's what you like to do, numerical analysis or uh, not only plaxis but FLAC and Soil Vision 3D. Um, there's a 
available this uh, synthesis on comb penetration testing. I can recommend that to you. It's free from TRB. And of course, the manual that, um, that uh, Ryan and um, David and uh, Derek and I put together a couple of years ago from MnDOT. Thank you very much. Cool, thanks, Paul. All right, we're going to uh, turn now to uh, some state experiences. So we've had uh, two great uh, introductory discussions by Gerald and Paul about where CPT is used worldwide and all the different applications and then uh, how to, the data is reduced and some of the very meaningful uh, parameters that we can get from the CPT. And uh, next we're gonna turn to uh, the state of Ohio, uh, where Andrew Jabzikowski is going to uh, talk to us about their experiences in implementing uh, the cone. Uh, he's the field exploration manager uh, with the Ohio Department of Transportation, Office of Geotechnical Engineering. He oversees conventional uh, and CPT uh, geophysical explorations, uh, registered professional geologist. And prior to his work with ODOT, Andrew uh, worked with uh, for 13 years in uh, private geotechnical engineering consulting in the Midwest. So Andrew, um, take it away. Thanks, Derek. I'm just gonna do a brief overview of our uh, CPT rig, uh, how we use it in direct design, and then go over a few specific project applications and some of the lessons we've learned in, in uh, using our CPT. Having a bit of a delay here. All right, there's my second slide. So at ODOT, we have a conventional capability of, with two truck mounted rotary drilling rigs, uh, two ATV rigs, a, a man portable drill rig, uh, DCP equipment, resistivity equipment, and the capability to do seismic refraction and REMI, and uh, some in-situ testing equipment, including pressure meter and uh, rock dilatometer. Uh, I came to ODOT in 2015, and I had no real experience with CPT, and I, I think it's safe to say now I'm a converted cone head. Um, the research conducted, there was some research conducted by Ohio State and ODOT in 2007 that uh, led to the purchase of our, our CPT unit. I was ordered in 2008 and delivered in 2009, manufactured by AP Vandenberg in the birthplace of the CPT in the Netherlands. Our CPT unit is a, it's a crawler unit. You can see a, a good picture of it in our first slide. It's a remote control operated, weighs 23 tons and has, uh, well, it weighs 40, 48,000 pounds. It has the capability to generate uh, about 23 tons of down pressure. Uh, considering its weight and Paul talking about uh, CDL requirements earlier, that's important to consider because we had to come up with a, uh, a total haul weight of something under 80,000 pounds in order to stay under a, a permit requirement. And just a little overview of our interior of our unit, we have a touchscreen PLC on the, on the right here. Uh, our data is recorded on a laptop computer. It's transcoded with some uh, various equipment. The depth is, uh, is measured with a depth encoder, and these are the two primary hydraulic pistons. For a piezo cone to get a good pore pressure response um, measurement, you wanna make sure your cone's de-aired. So on board, we have a, a vacuum cylinder and we de-air our cones in silicone oil. And then here you just see a close up of the uh, cylinders are raised and we're about to lower the lead rod into the hole 
This is what we call the uh, rod wiper. It keeps the soil from coming back up into the cab. Our standard cone is a piezo cone and we have five in service. Um, we keep them, try to calibrate it once a year or 2000 linear feet. So to calibrate it, we send it back to AP Vandenberg and that can be about a, a three to six month process sometimes. So we typically have one in transit and three to four in operation. And we maintain enough rods to push to a, about a total depth of 120 feet. So you see our seismic cone on the bottom is a separate cone and this is different than some of the other manufacturers but it adds significant length to our string. So when we're starting, we have to consider that, that we, we're gonna have to be able to raise the rig high enough to get our, uh, our seismic cone behind it. And we just use a single geophone. So if we wanted to add yet another one, uh, it would be difficult to do without doing some sort of pre-drilling. For seismic pushing, um, we equip our rig with a, a seismic trigger that's on the rear plate of the rig. And uh, we've, it's got a right and a left hammer for shear wave measurements, and then a, a center hammer for uh, P wave measurements. So when I first came to ODOT, I had to learn uh, how we can utilize our CPT and you know what, what are its limitations. So whenever we get a project in, we always ask ourselves, can we push it? And our, usually our first question is, you know, what's the depth of bedrock going to be like? In certain areas of Ohio, it's, it's right at the surface. But we have plenty of regions of Ohio where uh, CPT is applicable with lake deposits, peat deposits, colluvium that's uh, loose enough to push. Um, there's certain areas up around Cleveland where, where bedrock exceeds 250 feet. After we've determined that, you know, we, we think we can get some usable information out of the CPT, we, we do a field recon because the rig is big, it's heavy, and when it gets stuck, you, you have to use a really large wrecker to get it out. So uh, we want to make sure that we, we don't get us, ourselves into a scenario where we um, are completely buried and have no other options. When we're on, we frequently do work on construction sites. And we, we have a grade limitation of uh, pretty much two to one. Once we acquire our CPT data uh, uh, sounding, the AP Vandenberg system uh, is recorded, the data is recorded as a, a GRU file, they call it a gorilla file. Now on the left, you see the, the header for a, a typical sounding where you get all the information about the, the serial number when it was last calibrated. Um, that sort of thing. You can add, you can put your GPS information in here. And then here's the data for just the first meter of a sounding. So you get not even the first meter or uh, not quite there, but you get a lot of data. And we use uh, C petite or C petit, depending on how you pronounce it, to process our data currently and to go from a GRU file to that particular piece of software it requires about three different steps, so it's a little bit cumbersome. Uh, we are looking at Rapid CPT. Uh, it's a plugin for GINT, and so far it looks pretty promising. So the holy grail of CPT use is is direct design. You know, go right from a sounding to a design in, in a matter of days. And we do use CPT for direct design for spread footings of uh, culver head walls, abutments, and, and piers. And following research presented by Maine and Wohler, this was presented by Alex Detloff in our office at the Ohio Transportation Engineering Conference in 2016. Now, currently, a majority of our in-house design for culverts in the, the glaciated areas of Ohio are, are using CPT. Driven piles, we, we don't do direct design of driven piles with CPT, but we do use CPT data quite a bit. Um, our current methodology has been presented by Mr. Detloff as well at the Ohio Transportation Engineering Conference in, in 2015. 
But we've really come to the conclusion that we need to have more data corresponding to uh, CPT soundings and, and load test data. So some of that uh, information has been collected in some research recently I'll touch on in a little bit. Other design applications we've used CPT for are uh, peat and soft soil delineation. We've had great success using it in conjunction with resistivity. We've used it for real estate evaluations. You get a call and we've got a parcel that we're looking at for maybe a, a new garage. Uh, we need a quick way of evaluating it. We don't have time for, for lab testing. It's, it's really done a nice job for that. We've used it for landslides to define slide masses and, and we find the pore water pressure, uh, pore pressure measurements very useful. And then we've used it to define the top of rock and hard glacial till. In my experience, I know um, Gerald said that you can go up to uh, N values of 80. In Ohio, we've really found that once you get above 30, uh, an N60 value of 30, that you're really, we're pushing our equipment to the max. And well, if we go beyond that, we're probably running the risk of breaking something. We've used it to confirm uh, in place material density. We just use it this year to confirm the existence of sand backfill around the culvert. So we, we regularly use our CPT to augment borings. Uh, specific project applications uh, include the Valley View Bridge, which is currently under construction. This is uh, two spans that were uh, reaching the, the end of their deck design life. So in order to accomplish a redecking, we built a third bridge in between them. And we were involved with the uh, foundation design for that project from the start. Well, really to, to uh, complement existing geotechnical information, conventional geotechnical information. And that bridge just opened up in, uh, I think it was in October. So as part of our work here, once we actually started construction, we started doing soundings at right at the test pile locations and uh, immediately after driving the test piles as well, performing dissipations uh, before and after to see if we could capture the, the poor pressure response. And I'm, when I say after, I mean like right after we drilled or right after they, they drove the pile, we were, we were there with a, a sounding, but we didn't really get the resolution we were looking for in the data. So that kind of evolved to a, a research project where we had three sites throughout Ohio where we performed a sounding at, uh, at each site where there was gonna be a test pile driven. We performed a, a sounding right at the test pile location and then offset from the test pile and, and did a little bit different way of installing a vibrating wire piezometer. Uh, we did them in three, three different offsets, two, five, and 10. I think we also did four, eight, and 10 at another site. But uh, this is, I use vibrating wire piezometers a lot in the private sector, and they're, they're a little bit pricey, but they get you a lot of information. And this way of installing them was much quicker than using a conventional rig and didn't tie up a conventional rig. And it got us information about the, a lot of information about the site with the CPT uh, when we did it. So we, we would push a pilot sounding where we stopped about a meter above our target depth, and then we threaded our our uh, vibrating wire tip through a larger string of steel that we had on hand that we, we no longer use. So we threaded the wire for the vibrating wire piezometer just as though it were a, a string of CPT rods, with a conventional cone on it. Here you can see us threading the, the wire through the string. And then the result was we're able to push that a vibrating wire tip to our target depth. We can use a depth encoder on the rig to accurately set it and uh, withdraw the rods. And the tip is large enough that it just stays behind with friction and the hole collapses behind it. Anything that's left open, we fill with a uh, granular bentonite. Then we wired all the offset vibrating wire piezometers to a data logger and logged the uh, poor pressure response throughout the pile driving. So here you can see that uh, 
um, the amount of time it takes for the, the vibrating wire piezometer to stabilize. And then you see the test pile drive driven and, and immediate responses. So we get a lot of great data from this uh, install. And of course, anytime you have uh, instrumentation on a construction site, you get a, a cut wire, it seems like. So they had to take a couple of manual readings. But overall, it, at, at all three sites, we, we've got a lot of really good data. Another project application where we recently used CPT was a construction issue in downtown Columbus at the I-70-71 split. Uh, we had a single boring that identified a, a zone of soft soil and the contractor was convinced that it was an isolated zone because all of the other borings in the area showed a very dense soil, a glacial till, outwash. Um, so we, we proposed the idea of bringing the CPT in to first confirm the soft soil zone and then see if we could use the CPT to, to delineate that soft zone and see uh, just how limited it was. The proposed fix that there was a concern of settlement here. So the, the proposed construction included uh, lightweight fill that was a proprietary lightweight fill that was gonna be very expensive. So we had the contractor uh, create access and do a little backfill. So we had a platform to work off of behind the wall. Uh, we completed 15 soundings in two days. And then in both days we had the Soundings completed in the morning and the, the report was complete in the afternoon. We used the N60 correlation to confirm the, the boring conditions. The boring was correct. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, an error in sampling or anything like that. And we were able to confirm that the soft soil zone was localized and we were able to non-perform the lightweight fill at uh, considerable cost savings to the state. Here's a, another project that where we use CPT, we had a, a landslide that required rapid response. And this is an area of Ohio where we typically have shallow bedrock in Noble County in Southeastern Ohio along I-77, just North of Marietta. Uh, typically we, we wouldn't really consider CPT here, but we looked at some of the historical information and it looked like this might've been a waste area. So we thought we could use the CPT to identify or define the slide mass. And so we've got a large area of soil sliding. Uh, the road was actually heaving up at the toe of the slide. So we completed two sections of sounding, soundings in a, a complete in a single day and uh, for total linear footage of 205 feet. And it was enough information to eliminate certain repair options. And it really helped us to refine the boring program so that we could uh, really target what we're what we're after with that. So in conclusion, I've learned a lot about CPT in the last five years. It certainly has its limitations, but it's so quick, fast, and efficient that I'm always looking to see if it's going to be usable for a, for a geotechnical exploration. Uh, it typically runs in the last five years. It's been about 10 to 20% of our overall exploration production. So uh, I'm always looking to use it. And I, you've got to know your geology. You've got to know if you can get there. You're going to need some support maybe to get the rig in and out. And you're going to really need to understand your equipment limitations. Uh, we've broken plenty of cones. Uh, we found that our early seismic cone use was a little brittle. And uh, we, we've taken to the process of doing a standard piezo cone push and then offsetting to do a, a seismic push afterwards just to make sure we don't have any boulders in the area. Um, and with that, operator training and knowledge sharing is very important. A good operator of a CPT unit can tell when he's on top of a boulder. He can tell when he's tipped out in rock or, or hard till. And uh, it's important to have a few people that can, can, uh, can operate the CPT and, and share that knowledge. So our goals at, at Ohio are to increase the use of seismic CPT. 
um, streamline our CPT data processing and our data management and incorporate it into a DIGS compliant uh, database. And that, that'll allow us to get our CPT data out on our transportation information mapping system where you can just go in and download that data in a, a DIGS XML and bring it into the design software of your choice. Uh, right now out there, we've got, I believe we've got about 1300 different data points that are uh, DIGS data that you can use that way. In addition to uh, thousands upon thousands of points of historical information. And that's all I've got. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Greatly appreciate that presentation uh, with respect to Ohio's experience. Our next speaker today is going to be Ricardo Todd. He's with the Missouri Department of Transportation and has worked with them since 2006 and lately has been involved uh, with their cone penetration operations. Share screen. Share presentation. Did he come up? Okay, can you guys see my thing there? We can. Okay. Well, my name is Ricardo Todd. I'm the basically the Modot Conehead. I was given this opportunity by Mike Fritz and Kevin McLean, our director who have just retired the other day, he has moved on to do greater things at MST. So this presentation that I kind of put put forward was kind of a SPT versus CPT, you know, or argument to take to the beam counters why we need a new unit. So here we go. Oh, All right. So basically, we all know that um, the CPT method is used to basically delineate the, you know, soil properties and, the, you know, this give you a better stratigraphy of the soils. So basically um, our program started in 97 with Kevin and it was basically to, for l pile purposes and a alternative to the whole standard penetration metallurgy. So I was reading a, <laughs> a engineering magazine and I saw this quote in there and I had to use it, you know, saying that, you know, the, see, um, the CPT provide us a better characterization than SPT and the SPT method has not been improved on over these years. And we think the SPT now method need to be placed in the cabinet with the fax machine and the slide rule. So basically, these are some of the pros and cons of the SPT method. It's very messy, you know, long turnaround inaccurate blows and operator errors. The CPT, no better night required, quicker turnaround, accurate broken and minimize operator error. This is our old failing that we use, use down there in sand country and it's a moderatory process. As you can see, this is what we got to deal with. So our CPT is mostly used in the boot hill of Missouri. And this is like sand country of Missouri. We have very deep sands down there and we have 697 bridges down there. So we tend to use the CPT a lot down there. This is where we started at. We had a CME 850 and we used to push the cone from the back of it. So this is our old setup, you know, the rod push setup that we had, the old anchors. We used to anchor it with old um, tire anchors and the old rod basket. 
And this is our seismic hammer system. We had a four by four with a piece of metal and you strike it to get our seismic reading. This is the old computer powered by a 12 volt battery out in the field. This is how it used to be transported around in the back of the old Jimmy. So this is our current um, CPT rig. It's a Hogan Tiger little trap mounted rig with a 10 ton push, 15 ton pole with a little 29 horse HP diesel engine on it. It's manufactured by Vertec and it's classified as a light hydraulic powered auger. So it's anchored down by a auger system. And this picture here was taken in Arkansas. We were doing a research, a liquefaction research project for Dr. Rick Kaufman of the University of Arkansas. And we actually broke, we actually broke a rod here. Kevin was pleased about it, but yeah, um, Dr. Kaufman wanted us to go 90 feet. And this is a site where they are building a steel plant and we pushed and we got the cone down to 70 feet and the consultant came over and he's like, we've been beating these piles all day and they ain't going past 70 feet. And as he said, 70 feet, I brought the rod. And Kevin wasn't pleased. So this is our computer setup. It's a vertex setup with a truck box and the information is stored on the computer here. I go, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going backwards, sorry, I'm so sorry. So basically, um, this is how we, our, our, our method of capturing the information with, with our cone system that we have. The data is captured using um, vertex, organ toggle vertex cone plot, and then it's analyzed using GeoMesky um, system and then the data is stored and and we use the Gint data plot because we use Gint in our office for all our geotechnical logs and store the data and all of that stuff. And I will show you how we combine all of that stuff. So here is, this is what we use for um, the organ togger as a, the data acquisition software. And the GeoMiski system, we use the CPT-8 for um, the bearing capacity, segment calcs, pile calcs, um, to interpretation, the, the dissipation. And for liquefaction, we use the CPT lake segment analysis. The, the liquid SV, we use that to use the old N60 data and bring it, bring the raw data into it, and it um, breaks it down into a, a readable digital liquefaction system. We have this stone V that we use to calculate when we are using stone columns. So we haven't been using use use that one as um as much. So I want to show you guys um how we we um we kind of we we put all the so this is a project ah, what did i do where did i go so this is a project that this is basically uh, Ricardo, we're not seeing your slide deck at the moment. I'm not sure if you stopped the screen share. Where did it go? Oh, no. Did I stop it? Share. This one? No, this one. Am I back online? Are you uh, seeing Let's my... see. We're seeing a, a memo. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to to show um, how we put the data together for 
using um, the, the three different softwares. So this is how we, we send the, the data using the three different software. So this is using GIMP. This is using the, 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 the GIMP to, to um, represent the, the CPT data. We do the corn plots and everything through GIMP. And then all the analysis, analysis stuff is done using the CPT. It. So this is where we um, provide them with like an L-pile sheet using all that data. And we use the LPC method for, for, for the piles. So we provide the designers with all of this using the, the methods that we get from, from the CPT data. This is kind of like how we present our, our, your, um, our bridge data. And this is how we present the liquefaction data. Yeah. So um, this this other this this other is a project. This is something very that we um very new to us. We are trying to use use the CPT data to um to show settlement settlement in a on a, on a, on a approach for for a bridge. So what we do we um we use it. We go out there with the CPT rig. And we, we, here's the era. So they're gonna shorten up the approach. So they're gonna fill in here, both here and here, up to here. And then we went out there with the CPT and we did a couple boring, we did a borings along and we presented them with the data. So what we did, we run a dissipation test. And from the dissipation test, we came up with the CH and we, we, we um, bear with me here. I'm gonna try to change the screen. Did it change? Are you guys seeing this? Hello. Yeah, we haven't seen a change. Yeah, yeah we're we're, st we're still on the design memoranda. It's a graphic of the CPT plot. H nineteen thirty six one hundred one in the lower right. I changed it to an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, you may need to stop and reshare it again. Stop share. Share screen. Share this one. So share. Yeah. So we took the the data from the CPT and we put it in this um this this sheet. And you know we came up with the settlement time and the the over over months based on using the CPT values, and then they came back and said you know it, it's too long, so we we decided to to surcharge it, and we did it more, and we kind of gave them something like this so we, this is kind of this 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 area is kind of new to us and we are working working with it to to do this do to do let me go back to the um, share screen where's the presentation yeah yeah so that's kind of like what 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 we're we're doing more that is doing with 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 our what is doing why is not doing that what I wanted to do oh yeah so yeah so this I'm just showing some of the you know the all how how it the we used to collect the data when it, you know using the all seismic logs this was using the all um Hog and toggler system, and this is you know using the new outputs, and that's that's you know as you see from the projects that I've shown, that's what where we are with it right now. We are new to it. I'm new to it. I'm I'm trying to learn it as much as possible, you know, and we have a long way to go. And this is our dream right now to get an enclosed rig. Reasons 
reasons being because when um, we go out, the dissipation takes forever. And if we have an enclosed rig, we can, you know, lock it up and leave it running, you know, that, you know, we get good dissipation data. And this is kind of what, what more that is hoping for and to use, use the machine more in, in, in the, in the, in the clay, clay, up, clay soils and all of that stuff. So we are work in progress and as we go along, we'll get better and attending these seminars and hearing from you guys, you know, give it, giving us a lot of hope, but, you know, just say, um, just to say that, um, one of the presenters said the, the cone can take up to certain amount of pressure, but I can tell him once once we see it gets to N60 of 50, we, we start to get worried because they break. So yeah, and they're pretty costly. So this is just our little spiel that we we have on our cone thing that we have going on over here. Uh, I can answer any questions at, at the end if anybody have any questions. Okay, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, yes, we sir. don't have any current uh, unopened questions in the chat at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but we do have just a few minutes uh, for to address some of the things that came in earlier. Uh, one of them uh, was with uh, uh, respect to uh, seismic CPT, and I'm gonna turn that question over to uh, Gerald. Joe, you're on mute. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for the reminder, Derek. Um, when it comes to seismic, uh, there are some references made that uh, you use geophones. Uh, obviously possible, uh, but uh, you should really think about the use of accelerometers. Uh, it gives you a much more detailed uh, signal uh, that you can analyze. And the other thing that, that often happened when there was a question asked about, can you get bad uh, data? Uh, when you are using seismic CPT near surface, it's important that you keep in mind that the wave does not travel in a straight line. Uh, it's uh, the, the least time principle from us principle that gets you uh, the correct answer. And if you assume that the wave is traveling in a straight line, you might get incorrect answers. And I'm talking anyhow, based on those uh, debates that you've had in the presidential campaign, they always go somewhere else. I briefly want to mention something that was mentioned in the last two presentations about uh, stop when you are at a uh, uh, SPT value of about 50 or 60, because otherwise you're going to break it. What I showed you was a graph uh, that, that used a 15 centimeter square cone, so an oversized cone uh, with a um, uh, undersized or the standard 36 millimeter 1.44 inches uh, rod that gives you a sturdier approach, but also to use a subtraction type cone. A subtraction type cone is sturdier than a compression type cone. And if you don't know the difference, uh, please feel free to contact me later on. But if you have those, uh, uh, those that combination, you can go to, to higher uh, or to harder uh, materials. The thing though is that if you hit rock, and you suddenly go from 50 suddenly up, then obviously you're going to break. But to say that you cannot push a cone into 70 or 80 uh, end value soils, that, that's not necessarily correct. OK, thanks, Gerald. Uh, just in our few moments here, uh, as we're ending uh, the day's presentation, uh, let's see. I'm gonna flip over here and share my own screen uh, to uh, talk about what's happening next week. But before I get there, uh, just a few reminders today. I think we learned that the CPT is a fast, efficient way. Uh, you can push a, push a cone in the morning and have it reported out in the afternoon. Uh, it's a great companion tool for exploration geophysics. Uh, the seismic CPT and the soil moisture resistivity probes can be used for very efficient ground truthing for ER and seismic geophysical operations, returning values that are essentially ready to go, uh, wave speed, resistance, and ohm meters. Uh, session recording reminder, all of our webinars in the winter webinar series are being recorded. 
Uh, the website for this is coming soon, uh, so we appreciate your patience as we get the uh, the web interface, and it'll also have contacts if you're interested in the presentations themselves. Uh, as part of the A game, uh, Ben Rivers and I here at Federal Highways are really, really excited uh, to highlight state experiences. Uh, a lot of our state colleagues are really doing some great work, so greatly appreciate uh, Andrew and Ricardo uh, sharing their experiences from Ohio and Missouri today, and also greatly appreciate uh, Paul Main and Gerald Verbeek uh, for their time and effort in providing their presentations. Uh, next week, uh, we'd like to uh, talk about, oh, there we go, slides back up. Uh, we're going to continue on uh, with winter webinar number seven, Measurement While Drilling, the Digital Drill Rig. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, December 29th, uh, same time, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, just what measurement while drilling is, a history of the technology, uh, some of the fundamental concepts and guidelines, and a case study with Montana uh, and their implementation. Uh, I will again be your moderator for that session. Uh, we'll also be having uh, uh, Anahita uh, Madariasari, uh, John Benoit, uh, Paul Hilchin, and Nick Jaynes. Uh, so another exciting uh, winter webinar session. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody again for attending this afternoon. It's been great. Uh, I apologize we didn't have uh, opportunity for uh, a, a QA discussion, uh, but I think we had a lot of great content along the way. Uh, so again, special thanks uh, to all of our speakers and to all of our attendees, whether or not you're joining us live, uh, or on one of the future uh, video uh, archives. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you next week. Thank you, everybody.